that work well in a mobile environment. And the one sort of fundamental assumption that, that all this is based on is that you need to have a clear separation between your HTML code and your CSS, whereas the HTML code is responsible for the content and the CSS is responsible for everything concerning the appearance and layout. Um, some of you that have done some HTML before prior to this class may have, in one of your assignments, done things such as use a table or use a break tag or maybe put some attributes in your HTML. And I probably didn't deduct, but I probably also mentioned that you want to avoid that. You want to do that via CSS. And here is why, to a large degree. You really, when you, when you, when you bake in aspects of the appearance in your HTML, which you can do because those are leftovers from the old days prior to, to widespread CSS support, but when you bake in aspects of the appearance in your HTML, you really, really limit yourself as far as the flexibility goes. So this was always true, and this is true when you're just talking about websites that you view on computers, on desktops and, and laptops. But this becomes so much more important now that mobile uh, websites are, are such a big consideration. So that's the underlying assumption. We're going we're gonna to really play it by the book and really only put content in our HTML, only put appearance in the CSS. So that's the fundamental assumption, all right? We mentioned that there's two differences between the mobile environment and the desktop or computer environment. I'll use the phrase desktop to mean any sort of computer, whether it be a laptop or a desktop. And the one difference is the physical differences in, in, uh, that, that exist. For example, the, the screen is typically going to be smaller on a mobile device than it will be on a laptop or a desktop. Even if the resolution isn't less, you know, even if there's the same number of pixels, they're likely to be a lot more densely packed. All right. Um, that's one difference. And, and other physical differences are the way the users interact with the device. That is touching the screen as opposed to using a mouse to clicking it, using an on-screen or, in some cases, physical keyboard, but a smaller keyboard, a little harder to type on, uh, as opposed to a larger keyboard. So the other physical differences deal with the fact that typically the processor is not going to be as fast on a mobile device compared to a computer, and typically the internet connection won't be as fast. This goes, this pairs nicely with the other set of differences. And the other set of differences is that people uh, are, are far less leisurely surfing the internet on a mobile device than they are on a computer, you know. On a computer, you know, we probably all have experienced this to pop online to look up one thing or to, you know, go to YouTube to look up one video and, you know, Three hours later, you're watching, you know, uh, you know, you're watching cats fall down the steps or something like that. You have no idea how you got there, but you know, it seemed to make sense at the time. People are less apt to do that on a mobile device. People are very uh, are, are typically much more focused on getting a specific answer to some question when they when they access the web in a mobile environment. And again, these are these are generalizations. They're not necessarily true in all cases, but. There's definitely, uh, uh, there seems to be a much more uh, uh, focused approach to surfing, uh, to, to surfing the web on a mobile device as opposed to a desktop. The desktop, yeah, there are occasions where you may be very focused on getting an answer, but there's also occasions where you want to explore or you're researching or you, you want to have a more uh, involved interaction um, with the web. Whereas typically, you know, um, you will use... Um, a mobile device to, to get a, a very specific answer to a question. These two things paired together imply that mobile sites ought to be simpler than their desktop counterparts. All right? And simpler in a couple different ways. Simpler in terms of the presentation that they have. Simpler in terms of the content they have. There, there typically may be less content on the mobile uh, version of the site as opposed to a desktop. Now, as with anything, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can achieve this. 
and I out I sort of outline three main ways. Uh, I, I guess you could say two of the ways are, are really just different flavors of the same way. But even within those two methods, there's like a myriad of ways that you can implement those two strategies. One of the strategies is to have a separate mobile site. All right? And that is where you have some piece of server-side code that redirects the user in one of two directions to the mobile site or to the full site. Now there's, the, 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 the downside of that is clearly, you know, you now have gone from maintaining one website to maintaining two websites. So you, you I won't say double the work, but you've increased your work. Now you can take steps to mitigate that. There's things that you can do to sort of mitigate that issue so that you're not literally doing twice the work. But you will be doing, you know, you have to take those steps and you have to do some planning and, and there will be some redundancies uh, of effort in there. So that's a drawback of it. The pluses of it is that's a relatively simple way to um, create an experience that's optimized for the two different platforms. To create an experience that is great for mobile users and great for desktop users. That's not to say you can't do it other ways. The question came up last time. Well, if we can write some code that will maybe hide some things from the mobile user, why would we ever go to two approaches? Well, it's a case of, you know, would you rather work on one complex web page or two simple straightforward web pages? Sometimes it makes sense to just say, okay, I'm going to make two copies of, the, of this page or this site. And yeah, I have two copies of every page to work on, or I have two copies of the site to work on, but each of them individually is so straightforward that it's, it's a piece of cake, as opposed to trying to sort of mutate and, and, and convolute one page so that it can adapt itself. That strategy, the strategy of having two different sites and redirecting to those, we're not really going to explore in too much detail. That requires uh, some server-side scripting and as the typical instructor uh, line goes, that's beyond the scope of this class. All right, so we won't talk about that in this class, other than to introduce that that's an option. We will look in, in, in some detail of the other option, and that is making a page, making one page that works well, both for a desktop and a mobile device. Now I mentioned, you could get lucky and your design could be simple enough that it looks reasonably good in both without really taking any special steps. All right? That was kind of the example we, we talked about last time. I showed a very simple page. With a very simple layout. And Again, it's bare bones, but you can imagine with a little bit of sprucing up, this could be a reasonable layout for a page. And then if we view the same page, let's fire up our mobile emulator. The layout would look like this, which isn't bad. So that's kind of like the best case scenario. You luck out and your design is such that it's serviceable both in a mobile and a desktop environment. Now that's probably not like real likely to happen. You probably will need to take some steps. In fact, in this case, I did sort of take a step by, if you look at the CSS file, I made the image use a relative width. That way, it will size itself to uh, the size of, of the container. All right? But this is just essentially a liquid layout with using percentages for everything. And that's typically what you're going to see in mobile layouts, is you're not really going to see fixed layouts when you're talking about something that you want to work well on, on a mobile site. 
And what sites do you want to work well on a mobile device? All of them. <laughs> All right. So that seems to imply that, that, that these floating layouts, these flexible layouts are the way to go as far as design goes. So notice how I'm floating everything. I'm setting width. I am setting some minimum pixels just to avoid that problem. Some, some folks' pages, if you don't put that in, if you really try to break it, you can by making a tiny, tiny screen. You know, things overlap or whatever. That's why I put the minimum pixels. That's kind of like, all right, you know, don't make it smaller than 200 pixels and, 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 and go from there. But simply with this floating, um, it looks reasonably good. And again, it was a little bit of sprucing up. It would look reasonably good in a desktop and a mobile environment. Something I was going to say a second ago, and I do not remember what it is. And I think it might have been important. <laughs> That's a nagging feeling, isn't it? Let me think. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I had a question from someone, and it probably would be good to address it. Um, I had a question online, and uh, it would probably be good to uh, address it as a reminder that if you notice in this page, this web page, I have a couple of things besides my style sheet in the header section. I have a style sheet called ff.css, and that's a little fix for earlier versions of Firefox. The purpose of this um, snippet of code is that earlier versions of Firefox didn't know what to do with HTML5, right? Because HTML5 ain't been invented yet when they were invented, right? So, of course, it's not going to know how to handle uh, HTML5. Fortunately, we can put a little fix in there that um, addresses it. And really, all this style sheet is, is it takes the, it doesn't resolve every issue with HTML5. But it takes the new tags that are used for structure, that is, the header, the nav, the section, the article, the aside, and the footer, and tells Firefox to treat them like a block tag. All right? Really, these new tags are really sort of specialized versions of the div. And the div is just a generic block tag. These are block tags that are used for more specific reasons. The bottom line is if, if we were able to tell Firefox, hey, these tags, you might not know what they are, but treat them like a block tag, and everything sort of falls in line as far as those tags go. Um. Well, let, let, let's get to that. Let's get to the HTML ship. This Firefox hack, if you want to call it that, um, addresses earlier versions of Firefox. And earlier versions of Firefox, and this is in, in a way sort of a beauty of, of browsers, is if they see a tag they don't know, they don't necessarily freak. Right? It's not like if you went into Visual Basic or Java or, or C Sharp and wrote an instruction that it didn't know about. It's going to blow up. It's not going to compile or do anything. HTML, if a browser sees something it doesn't know, well, it doesn't really do anything. It just renders it as plain text. And Firefox even is sophisticated enough that if we tell it how to handle those tags, it'll handle them the way we want to. So I can go in and I can put in the style sheet, hey, treat those tags. Firefox, you don't know what these tags are, but Treat them like they're block tags, and everything works out fine. Unfortunately, Internet Explorer doesn't work that way. In other words, the Firefox fix 
only fixes Firefox. All right? I want you, when you go home today, to say that five times real quick and see if you can do it. All right? The Firefox fix only fixes Firefox. All right? Because Internet Explorer was developed, uh, is very much different internally than Firefox and the other browsers. And in fact, you'll, you, you see this as a consistent theme, that a lot of these other browsers, such as Chrome and Firefox, are sort of de uh, developed on the, all, off the same base. So there's a lot of commonality between those. But Internet Explorer is sort of the odd guy out. All right? So that approach of hey, you don't know what these tags are, but treat them like a block tag and we'll be okay, doesn't work in Internet Explorer. If Internet Explorer don't know a tag, it doesn't know what to do with it. And even if you try to style it, it still doesn't know what to do with it. Using the same technique that we're using with Firefox. Using a simple, straightforward, slap in a style and say that they're all blocks. Someone, I think Google, or, or someone, it is available on Google site, went and created a little JavaScript routine. All right? And what this little JavaScript routine does is it goes through and essentially, and I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying this, but, but we, can, we can work under this model. Essentially, this little script this HTML5 shiv tells the browser, informs the browser about those new HTML5 tags. Informs it about the article and the header and, and so on and so forth. And tells the browser to treat those like block tags. And so effectively, you know, if we're going to do analogy, this is to Internet Explorer, earlier versions of Internet Explorer, what this is to Firefox. The difference is, is because they're different browsers written off of a different code base, different techniques have to be done. The, one second. The Firefox one is the more simple one. The Internet Explorer one is, is more simple. Now, those things that look like comments are not comments to Internet Explorer. They're code that actually goes in and runs and tells it is effectively an if statement that says, if I'm in IE that's less than 9, go and, and run this JavaScript script. Right. Yeah, uh, unlikely chance. Unlikely, uh, you know, unless you make it look like this. You know, uh, how do I want to say, in a history of, how, how do I want to say this? In the history of web programming, more people have intended to write a little snippet of a script like this and had it blow up than intended to put a comment and have it run some wild script. All right, so if you run into that, you know, that, that's one of those, you know, uh, you know, lucky you or unlucky you, depending on, on the consequences. The bottom line is really, um, maybe I should have said this before I went on the, the 10 minute spiel. I don't really care if you understand the details of this, other than to know that you probably should put these two little snippets of code, this little block of code, in all your HTML5 pages, because that will help with earlier version compatibility. Notice I didn't say it will fix all uh, HTML5 compatibility issues, but it will hit the big one, mainly that earlier browsers don't recognize these tags. And so these two snippets of code allow the browsers to recognize those tags. This one's straightforward. You probably have a fighting chance understanding what this one does. This one, I don't know, I, I've never even looked at that. Someone told me it worked. I put it in there and it worked. So there's really no need to worry about it anymore. All right. Yeah. No. 
this is important to know for mobile. Because if you don't put this in a mobile device, things could look weird. All right. Um, in fact, when I didn't have this in here, it displayed the mobile one like the desktop one. So it, it, it looked kind of ugly. So yeah, that's, that's needed for mobile. Yes. Okay. Now, here, the browser will bring up that bar that says show right. everything. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't specifically remember. Okay. Right, right. So the question is, and, and this is, this is the, the eternal question, I guarantee if there are 10 million web developers in the world, 8 million of them today, are saying, why does my page look this way in this browser and this way in another? That is, the, the, the idea again is that they're separate programs. They're programs that are meant to implement a specification. All right? But the specification is still being developed. So you have a case of, you know, a changing target. So one browser may implement some functionality that the other browser, even IE9, doesn't implement everything about HTML5. All right? And Chrome probably doesn't either. All right? But just depending on the combination of things that you use, number one, maybe the browser doesn't, you know, maybe they haven't even tried to handle that particular aspect yet. Maybe they've handled it and there's a bug. The bottom line is, is how do I want to say um, you kind of have to, regardless of everything, you kind of have to go back and test it. Now remember, your first line of defense is to go and validate your code in the W3C validator. All right? So in other words, I'm going to go and select all, maybe, and copy this code. So for example, if I had a browser compatibility issue with this one. I don't want W3 schools. I want W3C.org. I always make that mistake, or often do. Go into the HTML validator. Paste that code in. I broke the internet. Oh my god, do I have comments in there that actually triggered some code? Yeah. Yeah, that would be pretty funny. All right, at any rate, we'll let this chug for a while. Maybe eventually it will tell me what's up. Um, that would be sort of your first line of defense, is, is validating the code to make sure if everything's OK. In addition to validating the HTML, you can also validate the CSS. There's a separate validator for the CSS, though. So that'd be like your first line of defense. But you know there's a good chance that your code's going to validate. There's a good chance that it's not your fault that there is something in the browser, in which case, um, you just sort of have to work around and do the best you can to, to figure out a solution that works under both. Yes? Yes. Yes, that is true. If JavaScript would be disabled, so that could very well be the thing. You would want to make sure JavaScript's enabled. 
Now, if you haven't done anything, um, haven't done anything, you know, manually to configure your browser, if you just installed it, you probably will have JavaScript enabled. You kind of have to go and disable it on purpose. Uh, in IE, I can show you where it is here, maybe. But I have no idea where it would be in IE9. I think so. Got to remember. Yeah, but earlier versions of IE is weird. It uses ActiveX to do something that, such with JavaScript. I'm almost almost sure. Permissions here, I think there is. Scripting you can enable. I don't know where that would be in in H uh, in uh, IE nine. But that's a good point, if JavaScript would happen to be disabled. And keep in mind that if you're running it locally, it may think that and it may give you a warning message. That's the other thing. Even if you have JavaScript enabled, sometimes if you run something locally that has JavaScript, it will ask you for that. Um, There is an ActiveX object for JavaScript. I'm not 100% sure internally how IE. At any rate. Huh? Yeah, I mean, the, the meta tags are information about the page. Um, some search engines, especially in the past, use those to, to index things. I don't believe Google uses those at all. I think Google ignores the meta tags, but some search engines have used them. I generally don't make a big deal of using them. Um, but again, some folks for search engine optimization say to, to go and, and put those in. I, I usually, I usually just mostly don't regard them too much. All right. So, I guess you could call this one method of a, a, achieving a, a, a page or a site that looks good in mobile is, that is, have a simple up design so you really don't need to do anything and it still works fine under mobile. Again, it's probably not going to be very common. The other thing, though, and as far as responsive design, um, there is, is three ingredients. Um, this example showed two of those three ingredients. It showed a flexible layout, and it showed, or flexible slash relative layout, and it showed uh, relative flexible image sizing. In other words, the image was sized at 95% of its container. All right, as opposed to a you know a definite number of pixels. So that's two out of the three techniques or, or principles that are key in responsive uh, design. The third one is what is called CSS media queries. All right, we've seen examples. Uh, in fact, the last several homework examples have involved you writing two pages, one. You know, or, or writing two copies of the same page and, and swapping out the CSS. So you've all seen, and, and you know, if you want to look for more inspiration, you can look at the CSS Zen Garden site. But you've all seen examples of one page that looks a lot different based on the CSS. 
The question is, is how can we apply one style sheet in one environment and a different style sheet in another environment? All right? That's what we want to do. We haven't covered how to have like two different style sheets and, and switch between them. Well, there's something called a CSS media query. Um, if I go, for example, to I pick a news story. All right. There's a news story that I'm, I'm viewing on the screen, and it has a bunch of stuff on it. It has, you know, some navigation up here that I could that I could click on to take me to different pages. It has some ads. It has some pictures. Over here is a print button. Now, notice what this page looks like. This page is stripped of a lot of the um, extra stuff. There's no navigation on it, right? Because if we print this out on a sheet of paper, we can't push on the sheet of paper on links and have the piece of paper change, right? So there's really no point in having links printed on a sheet of paper, right? There's no ads, all right, because they're, they're cleaning it up for us and making it more simple and straightforward to print. Now, this could be done a bunch of different ways. So, I, you know, I haven't reversed engineered this to say for sure exactly how they do this. But, one way that they could do this is via having two style sheets for the same page. One that applies when you print, one that applies when you're viewing it on a screen. So, Here's what I want to look at. It doesn't matter what the style sheets look like. You have to take my word for it. But notice that there are two style sheets. One that applies for media of all, and one that applies for the media of print. Best known as a CSS media query. You take a look at the request. Is the request to print something or is the request to display it on the screen? And depending on whether you're going to print it or whether you are going to view it on the screen, you apply different style sheets. All right. This thought has been extended to do more involved media queries that can ask some questions about the browser that's viewing it. It can ask questions like, what is the minimum or maximum width of the browser? The thought being that, gee, if you're on a, if you're on a browser who is less than 400 pixels wide at most, you know, if, if the maximum width of a browser is 400 pixels, then you're probably on a mobile device. You're not on a desktop, right? No desktop machines have that tiny of screens, all right? So therefore, you can create a mobile-only style sheet. Or you can ask the reverse question. If the size of the screen is at least so big, you can assume that you are on a desktop, and you can apply a desktop style sheet. So these media queries, then, you can, you can fine-tune and get more specific 
And you can specify parameters by which a different style sheet will apply. Now, this was implied by our CSS, or I'm sorry, by our Firefox fix. It's possible to have two style sheets on the same page. Which of them apply if I have two style sheets on the same page? You have four choices. None of them, the first one, the second one, or both of them? And the answer is both. All right? And if there's a conflict at all, for example, if both of them I set the background color of the body to different colors, if I set it to green in one and red in the other, the second one applies. All right? So this takes advantage of this. Here's my style sheet that I really want, to get the style that I really want on this page. And here's the style sheet that is meant for the Firefox fix. All right? In this case, there's really no overlap between the two, so it probably doesn't matter what order I put them in. Um, Yeah, they click the print Okay. The, the question is, if I can paraphrase the question and tell me if I, if I misspoke. The question is, is, what is the mechanism by which the right style sheet gets applied? In other words, if I have a style sheet, and we haven't seen the example of this, but if I have a style sheet developed for the mobile or a style sheet that's developed for a desktop, what's the mechanism by which that's the one that gets applied? And... The answer to a question like this almost always is there's a whole bunch of ways it could be done. All right? One way to do it would be the server could be smart enough to look at the request. The request comes with some parameters concerning uh, who's making the request, what platform they're using, and so on. There's a database called the Werfel database that allows you to look at who's making the request, uh, the device that's making the request, and coming to some conclusions about the size of it, whether there's a phone in it, or whatever. So I could write smart server-side code that looks at who's making the request, that is the platform that's making the request, and only sends the right style sheet. All right, That's not what we're talking about in this class. That would require server-side coding. That is beyond the scope of this class. That is in the same category as the redirection, the traffic cop. That's just a, a extended version of that traffic cop model. Instead, our examples will be everything gets sent to the client and the browser sorts it out. Because the browser knows how wide it is, right? The browser knows if it matches these criteria or not. The browser knows, did you click the print button to print this out? The browser knows, hey, I'm on a mobile device and therefore my maximum width is 320 pixels. So the browser knows those things and applies the one that's relevant for its condition. So let's look at the example here. And to refresh your memory on this, and again, keep in mind, these are examples that are meant to illustrate something. They're not necessarily full-blown final product. Here's something that I'm viewing in a desktop environment. 
It is the exact same page being viewed in the mobile emulator. So that is the same HTML. If we were to do a view source here, and I don't know if we can do a view source here, but if we were to look at the source for both of these, that would be the same HTML. Yet clearly, the browser is smart enough to know, hey, I'm a desktop device, therefore use this style sheet. I'm not, therefore use this one. So let's look at the code. And we'll look at the style sheet, but more importantly, we'll look at the HTML because the HTML has in it the media query. So these are the two style sheets that I'm interested in. These are the two style sheets I'm interested in. This is just my fixes for Firefox and in IE. I have a base CSS file. There's no media query on it, so who gets this one? Everyone does. Even a print gets this one. All right? Even a print gets this one. The second style sheet has a media qu a query attached to it. So, who gets this one? Only if it's going to the screen. So if I went to print this out, this style sheet shouldn't apply. And the minimum device width is 601 pixels. In other words, the, the, the browser is, is 600, or the browser has a width of 601 pixels or greater. Now, like anything else, there's sort of the perfect world scenario, and there is a practical scenario. Actually, there is a special, just like there's print and screen, there's a special media for handheld devices, which is handheld. All right? That's where the only screen part comes in. It says only apply this to real computer screens, not handheld devices. The problem is, is that not all mobile devices identify themselves as mobile devices. Some of them lie. You know that? Some of your phones lie. Take out your phone and look it straight in the eye and ask if it's one of them phones that lie. Because some of those handheld devices don't say that they're handheld devices. They say that they're computer screens. They say that they're screens. And that's why we have the little catch in there for with. The upshot of this is Depending on the mobile device, if this had a wider than 600 pixel screen, for example, if I were to bring an iPad down, it's possible that this media query would kick in and I'd display the full site on an iPad, which I guess is okay, right? Because an iPad has a big screen, all right? But on a low-end phone, one that identifies itself correctly, if the width is not at least 601 pixels, it will use... I'm sorry, it will not use a style sheet, and therefore it will only get the base style sheet. Now, there, there's, there's two strategies, and, and they kind of have funny names. And I saw like the greatest analogy ever uh, for describing the difference between the two. All right? There's one that's called graceful degradation, and the other one is called progressive enhancement. And we're going to focus on progressive enhancement. But you should probably hear that term because some, some sites do that. Essentially, graceful degradation is more or less where you sort of retrofit on code to make it work, look for, work for a mobile site. In other words, you have a site for, that works on a desktop and you figure out, like, what hacks can I put in and what media queries can I get put in to get this beast look good on a, on, a mobile, on a mobile browser. The other one is progressive enhancement. And progressive enhancement follows the philosophy of mobile first. In other words, 
you develop first for the mobile device, then add enhancements for a more robust platform. And that's effectively what I have here. This base style sheet is a, the style sheet that I want everyone to get. The bare bone style sheet that just displays itself very, very simply. Then, if the platform meets these characteristics, they will get this as an enhancement. Now, this is through CSS media queries. Again, we could do something very similar via server-side coding. We might even be able to do something similar via JavaScript coding. All right. So there's a bunch of ways that we could implement this philosophy of progressive enhancement. But the idea is, is we have a starting point that everyone gets, then we add stuff in based on the capabilities of the device. At a full version and check. Let me give you the analogy, and this is like the best analogy ever. Let's say I had, I was going to throw a party, and I want to make, I hope there's no one that's allergic to peanuts in here, all right? But let's say I was throwing a party, and I wanted to get snacks for my guests, and I decided I was going to have three kinds of snacks for my guests, all right? I was going to have peanuts for people that just like to eat peanuts. I was going to have chocolate-covered peanuts for people that like chocolate-covered peanuts. And then I was going to have M&M peanuts for people that like M&M peanuts, the, peanut, the chocolate-covered peanut with a little candy shell on it. Now, I could get to that goal two different ways, right? I could get a whole bunch of M&M peanuts, right? And then I could boil off the candy coating for some of them, right? Or I could chip away, a little chisel, and chip away the candy coating for some of them, all right? So I'd have my chocolate-covered M&Ms, and I'd have a, a stripped-down version that, uh, or I'd have my peanut M&Ms, and I'd have my stripped-down version that was a chocolate-covered peanut. I could then take some of those chocolate-covered peanuts and melt away the chocolate and be left with a peanut. What would the other approach be? The other approach could be I could buy some peanuts, some chocolate, and some candy coating. And the peanuts, boom, there they are. Chocolate-covered peanuts, I'd take some of the peanuts, dip them in chocolate, there they are. The last one, I could take some of the chocolate-covered peanuts, dip them in the candy coating, and then I'd have the result. All right? Now, which of those seems like the more appealing one? The, the last scenario seems better, right? Instead of, in other words, taking something complicated and try to mangling it down into something that's simple, it seems better to start with something simple and progressively enhance it. So in our example, maybe the peanut is the mobile version of the site. Maybe the chocolate-covered peanut is the tablet version of the site. Maybe the, 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 the peanut M&M is, is the full-blown version of the site. We had a discussion in lab, me, me and one of the students had a discussion in lab uh, last time about me using the word mobile as though, like, there's mobile and desktop. In reality, mobile covers a wide range of stuff, right? Mobile covers my old uh, flip phone, right? That could browse the internet, kind of, right? It wasn't very good, wasn't very robust, but I could go and access websites on it. Mobile also covers the newer smartphones, which, you know, do a lot more. Mobile also covers tablets of different sizes and so on. So when we use the word mobile, for simplicity's sake, I'm just saying that there's mobile and desktop. Really, there's all sorts of, of gradations and gray areas. So we could, theoretically, using the principles of progressive enhancement, start with the most bare bones one. If someone has one of them brick cell phones from the 80s that has a tiny little screen on it, let's say, I don't even know what those look like, but that all it could do is show text we could make a style sheet that worked for that. We could then progressively enhance it for a flip phone, progressively enhance it for a smartphone, progressively enhance it for a tablet, progressively enhance it for uh, a desktop. Now again, there's all kinds of techniques we could do it. These media queries, is one, uh, the media queries are one of those ways that we can do it. We could also do something via um, 
server-side code as well. All right. At this point, this is where I put my advertising hat on and say if you are interested in this topic, we have just created some mobile development classes. Uh, and one of them is mobile web development, where we take essentially what we've covered today and, and last time and talk about it in much greater detail and talk about many of those things that I stated are beyond the scope of this, this class. Many of those things that are beyond the scope of this class are not beyond the scope of that class. We do cover them in there. We cover like using server-side code to switch between two sites and, and all that. There's also some great tools out there. All right, there's a tool that, you know, if you really want to have fun on the, the assignment about mobile, developing a, a mobile page, Google jQuery Mobile. All right, jQuery Mobile is a framework that allows you to create web pages that actually kind of look like mobile apps. Let me bring this up. Oh, we're already, <laughs> we already are on there. Actually, if we could imagine this, in fact, we don't have to imagine this. We can view it on the mobile emulator. jQuery Mobile is a set of tools that are easy to use that make a web page look like a nice little a nice little um, mobile application. This is simply an HTML5 page that's, that's styled very cleverly to look like that. So it's really a nice tool. Um, in fact, while we're on the topic of mobile, another thing you can do is you can use another tool called PhoneGap that takes your HTML5 pages and converts them into a native application for Android and iPhone. Real quick and dirty way to get a, a, a mobile application developed. I'm not talking about a mobile, mobile website, I'm talking about a mobile app that you could put on the App Store and download and so on. If you create HTML5 stuff, all right, style it via jQuery Mobile, you can then go and using PhoneGap very easily create an Android app or an iPhone app that, they, that people can download and, uh, and, and, and do it without spending the time. The problem with mobile development, if you're talking about developing apps, is with the two main players, Android and, and iPhone, you know, the skill sets are, are disjoint. Yeah, I'm, yeah they're, 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 they're way different. I mean, it's still programming, but you program in a different language, it's a different framework you're based on, you're using different tools. So, for example, I teach the Android classes, uh, Nora teaches the iPhone class. You know, neither of us could substitute for the other one if we were teaching that because I haven't done nearly enough iPhone and he hasn't done, to my knowledge, nearly enough Android stuff. So what do you do if you're an organization and you want to develop an app for both platforms? Well, there's a number of different options. But that seems to be my, my catchphrase today. There's a number of different options, but one of your options is to forget developing in those native platforms, develop some HTML5 pages, and use a tool such as PhoneGap to make it, uh, to convert it into an iPhone's app and, and an Android app. Is, is there any loss of functionality? There is, I haven't, I haven't done, the question is, is do you lose anything by doing that? And uh, from a theoretical perspective, the answer almost has to be yes. <laughs> right, just because, you know, you always lose something in translation. And I ha I'm not familiar, I haven't done enough on it to tell you where the pitfalls might be. 
Um, I do know there's libraries that allow you to, like, for example, access the camera. So you could you could get that functionality into your web page and and all those things. But you never know. First of all, is that going to be a less efficient way to do it? Is it prone to breaking? So yeah, whenever you translate, yeah, that's kind of the downside. The the upside of developing something in in the the specific platform is you could make it work perfectly in that platform. Whereas doing something like this, there's always the risk that something isn't going to work out just right. Well, you see, I would disagree with that. I would say it depends on specifically what your application is doing. You know, um, I, I was working on a, a simple Android application that looked at someone's RSS feed and essentially made, you know, from their blog and essentially just made a mobile app version of it so that someone wouldn't have to go to the browser to, to look it up or like in one case it was a Facebook feed. You know, some people are anti Facebook or they don't want to log on to Facebook and look at it or sift through it or whatever. So what this did is it took their, their Facebook feed and just formatted it for a mobile application. That's pretty vanilla, right? That not a lot could go wrong with that, right? I mean, there's a potential but there's less chance of issues with that as compared to a real robust application that did all kinds of things and in, in incorporated with um, um, incorporated with um, you know many of the devices um, resources like the camera or the accelerometer or, or anything like that. But yeah, I'm resistant too. But again, it, it depends on the usage for that, uh, what you're using it for. For something that's fairly simple, there's probably not that big a deal. Probably okay to use it for that. Other questions? All right, we'll see you over in lab.